on, on, on. <laughs> but, but, but the reason, though, that we want to do this is because we just don't want to preach you something and then, you know, kind of just leave you alone. We want to do something that will be ongoing and allow you to continuously uh, uh, overcome and, be, and, and remain liberated in your finances. Okay, we're going to receive the offering. So if you've got yours ready, we're going to be giving that to the Lord. Um, today, what I'm going to really be talking about is giving. Um, there are levels of giving. And uh, I want you to think right now why you're doing it. Why are you giving? Uh, what is your motive? Because what I want to really want to talk about is, is the motives that are in us to give and, uh, and how God wants us to develop in, in, that, in that process of giving. Uh, so be thinking right now, what motivates you to give? Let's lift it. Father, we love you. Lord, we come. Lord, take what we're giving. Take it, multiply it. <laughs> Okie dokie. Oh. Jesus said that uh, the degree of our love for him is directly related to the degree of forgiveness that we have gotten. The degree of giving, of breaking your alabaster box, breaking the most precious thing you have, and anointing him with it, is directly related to your love because he forgave you. I've forgiven a lot. And, you know, maybe that's why I love him like I love him and I, I do what I do. But man, I'm telling you, I want you to be turning your Bibles this morning. I'm going to try to keep you up with me some to turn to Psalms 116. Uh, I'll read verses 12 through 14 here in just a minute. Today is the last part of a four-part series that we've done on financial liberation. Today's lesson is spiritual development and giving. Spiritual development and giving. I'm always glad when it's the last message of one of these money messages. Um, I look back to see how long it had been since I had taught on anything concerning this area. I really avoid it. I don't like to do it. Um, you know, people come, they visit, and they think all preachers talk about is money, and that's not true. And that's not what this one's been about at all. It's really been trying to get people financially liberated by the, by the word of the Lord. Uh, Today's lesson is going to take a little different twist. I've thrown a lot of numbers at you and given you percentages and interest and a lot of, uh, a lot of thought stuff. Uh, today's message is, is a little bit different because you see, if you have all the money that there is, but you don't know how to give, you're still in financial bondage. You still are not experiencing liberty. A part of true financial liberation is being able to give. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, when I was in college, one of my most favorite, or probably the most favorite class that I had was psychology. And, and psychology means the science of of mind and behavior. It's psychology, psych, your mind, ology study. Uh, it's a study of the mind or the study of the soul. And Jesus came to save souls. Am I right? So he came to save our minds. He wants us to think right. When he, when he washes us, he wants to wash our minds. My favorite part of that was understanding human nature. And, and learning how we, we progress. Uh, every, every human has, a, has, has need, our needs. We, we develop uh, uh, through 
five essential needs that we develop through. And I'm going to give you these quickly because I'm going to spring off of this into developing in, in, in spiritual giving. The first human need is food and water. If you're starving to death, nothing else really matters, does it? Uh, now, none of us have ever really been there, but, but you know how you get when you get hungry. It doesn't matter what's on television. It doesn't matter what it, if when you're hungry, you want to eat. And that is a basic need. That is the bare need that we have is, is, is hunger and water, food and water. That is the basic need. And once we've obtained food and water, then we're now ready and able to advance to the next level of need that we have, which is shelter and, food, shelter and safety and security. Uh, we, we come into, into, into the next layer. And then we begin advancing up until we finally come to the, to the top area of advancement in our development. And at that top layer of advancement in our development, uh, we have become a full person or a fulfilled person. The third level of development is, is companionship. Uh, uh, when Adam was in the garden, he had food and water and he had shelter and he even had the presence of God in his life every day. He would walk with God. But God said that wasn't good. It's not good that man should be alone. And so he gave him a companion, a helpmate. And so once we've gotten satisfied in our food and our water and our shelter, we begin to look for companions. We want friends in our lives. We want relationships. We begin looking for a mate. Once that's taken care of and once we begin to develop correctly there, we, we move into the fourth level, which is self-worth. We want to be accepted. We want to be needed in life. We want to find something about life that, that needs us. And we begin looking for that. And then if we continue to develop into a complete person, into a fully developed mental person, we come into the area of self-realization. We realize what we're here to do. We're real, we realize why I breathe in and I breathe out. We realize what I was created for, and from that comes a self-realization and a self-fulfillment, and I become a total happy person, mentally and physically. This is, this is the advancement. Now, the reason that I'm sharing this is simply because there are developments in our spiritual life as well. As we, if we develop first the natural, then the spiritual, if we understand that, that we are developing in our soul realm, in our, in our mental realm, we'll also understand that we do, do develop in our spiritual realm as well. And without proper development, if you hang up on any level, You'll never become a fulfilled believer. And so what I wanted to do today was look through this aspect of giving because a part of our development is giving. Uh, if we don't understand how we are to give and we hang up at one of those level, levels, we'll never develop into the person that Jesus wants us and called us to be in his kingdom. So I want to start at the bottom one and I want to work up. And I want to give you five essential development processes that the, that the believer will go through in their learning to give the way that the Bible teaches us to give. So the first one is membership. That's the bottom level. Uh, membership. Um, what we talk about here is becoming interested in something. It's like, you know, you, you come to church and you like something that the church does. Maybe you like the teaching or the youth ministries or maybe you like the praise and the worship, but there's something that interests you. It's like a club. You begin going to a club, an uh, uh, Elks club or, or a country club, and, and you look at giving as dues. Um, you know, this is where I go, so I should give something. Everybody else is giving something, so I should give something also. And that's sort of the mentality that we give. We, we pass the plate and so we drop something in there because we don't want anybody to think we're not giving. And so we began to give. And I was a member at a country club here and played golf up here at the battlefield. And, and you know, as long as I paid my dues, they'd let me play. I could go anytime I wanted to. Take any, anyone I wanted to take with me and play golf. But you know what happened when I stopped paying my dues? They wouldn't let me play. I had a hunting club one time, and when I hunted long years ago, deer hunting, and, uh, 
And we, we would all divvy up and we would bring our money and we would pay our dues. And if you paid the dues, then you got to hunt. And this is the belief or the, the, the response that some people have to giving to God. If I don't give God something, he's not going to bless me. We're paying our dues. Uh, not long ago, I was invited to join a club, um, AARP. Now, I know that <laughs> some of you young people don't know what that is. It's a club for us people that are over 50. We get to join this club, and we get reduced rates at hotels and discounts here and discounts there because we're senior citizens now. And as long as you pay those dues every year, you get those discounts. In other words, you, you pay to get the deal. And a lot of people approach giving to God for the deal. It's the club. It's the interest thing. Do you know that some denominations are actually built on that, on that process? Uh, you, you, you'll, you'll sign a membership card, and sometimes people call it a letter. You'll sign that. And what that says is that you're going, you're, you're, you're swearing, you're signing in blood the deal. And, and you're, 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 you're supposed to give your dues. And some people, some places, some denominations go as far as putting, putting the names of the people who have signed the deal on the board so that all the rest of the members can see. Let me tell you something. God never mentions the deal in the Bible. See, church is not a club. Amen. You'll come to LifeGate and you'll receive every ministry we have here if you never give a penny. Because Jesus didn't come to get your money. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. It's not a deal we're making with him. And when we give from that mentality, we're missing the process. And I can't even give you a scripture on that one. But that is where a lot of us began giving. I remember the first time that I went to church, they passed the plate and I dropped something in. And you know, and every time, but it was, I, I didn't stop there. That is where most of us begin our giving development though. But the Bible doesn't make deals. Now, let me show you the second one. I can't give you a scripture on this one. It's gratitude. Gratitude. Uh, we give from gratitude. And I'll show you the scripture here in Psalms is where you're turned in your, in your Bible. And we'll, we'll read it together. It'll be on the screen for those that don't bring your Bible. And please start bringing your Bible. You know, my wife was speaking to me this week. She says, Delbert, she says, we really need to get stirred up in reading the Word of God again. And, and teaching the Word of God again. And stirring people up to, to read that Word regularly again. So bring your Bible. And, and look, let's look at these scriptures together. Let's reason together. Let's be more noble than the Thessalonians, right? Let's, let's be like those Bereans. Psalms uh, 116 verse 12 says, Now, how can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. And then looking at that same verse from the Living Bible, it says, But now that I can, but now what can I offer the Lord for all he has done for me? I will bring him all, an offering of wine and praise his name for saving me. I will publicly bring him the sacrifice I vowed I would. David, the man after God's own heart, says, How can I? Thank God enough. How can I repay God for all he's done for me? Uh, how can I thank him for saving my soul? How can I thank him for saving me? I know. I know how I'll do it. Here's what I will do. I will toast the Lord. I will lift up my cup of salvation to him. What I'm going to do to thank God is I am going to be grateful. Out of gratitude, I will give my vows. Out of my gratitude will come my giving. I will come into the sanctuary with the people of God, with the congregation of God, and I will contribute my money with their money or my giving with their giving, and we will thank God for saving us. It's not dues. 
It's gratitude. Gratitude is where it begins. Now, our region has just gone through this terrible tragedy in Noble. Um, and we've grieved with these poor victims and their families. But we've been so grateful for those that have worked there and labored with this tragedy. Those that have had to handle these victims, the workers. People have poured out and giving. We wanted to do something as a church and, and everybody feels gratitude because, because you're thankful. The thing in New York on 9-11, on uh, yes, that was horrible and nobody can ever express how horrible that was, that the victims. But, was, but another tragedy that happened there that really pricked our heart was the firemen and the policemen who were there trying to save and help people that were killed in that incident as well. And we're, we're grat we have gratitude for those people. We're, we're thankful for them. And when our heart is touched with gratitude, we want to give. We wanted to do something for our region. People wanted to do something for the victims of 9-11. Our heart Hearts are so touched at that time that oftentimes we can be conned. A lot of money was given for 9-11 that never got there. Do you know, what, did I say that right? Because people just pour out. Remember, the, just the blood, people gave blood, and before they could use the blood, the blood went bad. Because our hearts are so moved by gratitude. And when we realize what Jesus did for us, it will move your heart with gratitude. And you can't help but pay your vows to God. You know, when, when man messed up, when, when Adam really blew it, God could have turned his back and, and said, I'm going to start all over again. Even wanted to do that one time with Moses, but you know he didn't do it. He said, no, I've got a plan. Though it is a mess, I am going to clean this mess up. I am going to send my son to clean the mess up. He sent his son to clean your mess up. I don't care how much concrete and steel has fallen on you. I don't care what you're buried under. He can clean your mess up. And he sent Jesus to the cross. And Jesus, the Bible says, came willingly. He opened his palms up, he opened his hands up, and he was pounded to that cross willingly. Right. He, he opened his hands up and they pounded him so that he could give his life. Right. And that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead also quickens your mortal bodies. The body that you have right now, that spirit of giving... Is in you. And when you begin to feel gratitude, your hand opens. And you willingly give. You give your resources, you give your talents, you give your time. Because God has cleaned your mess up. Hallelujah. He's washed you from your stuff. And when that happens to you, the moment that quickens inside of you, our gratitude whelms up and comes out of your hands, comes out of your mouth, comes out of your time, comes out of anything you've got to give. You give it with gratitude. Oh, I toast you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. What can I do? I know one thing I can do. I'll come to the congregation and I'll combine my giving with others' giving. And we'll accomplish something for the kingdom of God. Gratitude. Third level. I need you to turn to Matthew chapter uh, 8. Third level is obedience. Obedience. Um, this is when we honestly and sincerely come to a place where we say, Lord, you just tell me what to give. Tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Just speak the word. Jesus uh, 
had encountered uh, a Roman centurion who understood authority. That's the big deal in that passage. He understood authority. And he came to Jesus and he said, Lord, I have a servant who is ill. He's sick. And I want you to heal him. And Jesus says, well, I love to heal people. Let me do that. And he says, well, I, I don't want you to come into my house. I'm a man of sin. And, you know, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. He says, but if, if, you'll just, if you'll just speak the word. Now, let me show you this passage in, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 7. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. And the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus became astounded at that. Um, the, the, the King James says he marveled. Why? Because the guy understood authority. See, authority is not dominating over. Authority is not ruling with a pounding fist. Authority is covering and protecting and healing and taking care of those that are under you. This man had a revelation of what authority is. It always blows my mind when, when men say, my wife won't submit to me. Well, there's usually a reason. Are you covering? Are you protecting? Are you healing the family? What are you doing in the right area of authority? Because when you get it right, Jesus marvels. And he says, I don't know a lot of people like this. In fact, in all of Israel, I've never seen anybody that really understood authority. This lost Gentile understands authority better than the people of God understand authority. Just speak. The word. <laughs> Look at uh, verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I've not found anyone in all of Israel, in Israel, with such great faith. You see, this is just say the word faith. This is the kind of faith that says, Lord, you say what to do and I'll do it. Because I understand authority. I understand that if I get this one right, you'll cover me. If, if I properly submit to you, you'll heal me. If, if I properly submit here and do it the way I'm supposed to do it, you'll bless me. You'll protect me. You'll heal me. Just say the word faith. And so when it comes to my giving, I approach my giving this way. Lord, just say the word. How much and how should I give? Um, what does your word say about giving? What do you say, Jesus, about giving? And he'll say, man, I, I don't know a lot of people like that. You, you, I'll, I'll do it for you. And so you ascend. It's, it's not membership anymore. And it's, it's not only gratitude. You come into a, an arena with him where, where you begin to move by faith. And you understand authority. And you understand that he really wants to bless us. Now, LifeGate Church is a kind of a just say the word church. We've had several defining moments over our year, uh, years as, as a church body. And, uh, and a lot of those defining moments, we had to determine if we were going to be a just say the word church or not. Or were we going to do it the way men wanted to do it? Or were we going to do it the way the, the word of God says to do it? And we made a decision a long time ago that we're going to be a just say the word church. It's caused lots of problems for us. People don't like us sometimes. They talk about us. But you look at how we did it and what we did and you'll find we did it because he gave us the word. It's according to his word 
What does he say in his word? You and I have to make that decision. We have to develop into that place. You don't start here. You develop here. You develop, just as you develop in the natural with food and shelter and and relationships, you develop into this arena with God. You develop here where you can trust Him, where He can say, just say the word. Where you can say, just say the word, and He will. And you learn to trust Him there. I need you to turn to Mark 28, Mark chapter 10, verse 28. If you try to turn to Mark 28, you'll not find it. Let me give you the next one. <clears throat> the fourth one. Sacrificial development. Sacrificial. Over the course of a believer's life, God will move upon you once or twice. This isn't the normal. This happens once or twice during the believer's life where he moves upon you to do something I'm going to say this, and if it's not right, we'll edit it out or something, but that will scare the hell out of you. Now, that's, that's a good scare. Because in your giving arena, he will challenge you to give everything, to leave it all. And it's not the normal, and it's not happen, it doesn't happen a lot, but once or twice in your adventure with him, in your journey with, with Jesus... He will ask you to do this. And and Judy and I did it. You know, and it's frightening. It's like uh, walking a tight wire across the Niagara Falls. You you know, you get about two steps out and you say, what am I doing? (laughs) How how did I get here? (laughs) And, and, but there you are. Uh, Judy and I, have done this. Um, what happened is the house that we built and, and we built it debt free. The Lord, and I can show you right where the sanctuary was turned this way. Our platform was over there. We were sitting. I can show you exactly where we were. And God spoke to me and said, give your house. Uh, praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. They'll give you a house. I rebuke you, devil, in Jesus' name. <laughs> and I'm crying because I know it's the Lord. At least I sure am hoping that it is. You know? <laughs> and I was, Judy, God just told me, give the house. She said, are you sure? <laughs> and see, like, that was like the last bridge we burned the last bridge. When this was gone, there was no going back. It was going on. And so we did that. Uh, we gave that house into the kingdom. And uh, uh, I wish I could tell you I went home and, you know, money started falling out of heaven. And, you know, I looked in the backyard and there was this money tree. I, I wished I could tell you that. I wish that I started getting cards and letters in where money, people were just sending me money. But it didn't happen. That was sort of around January or February of the year. It came April, and tax time came, and I didn't have money to pay taxes. Uh, I had to sell my, my boat. I had to sell my, my, my arsenal. I had to sell everything so I could pay my taxes. But I learned more about God Amen. in that time of my life. Than in anything else, I saw the provision of God take care of me and my family. I saw him replenish us with more than we had to start with, much more than we gave. I saw him take care of me, take care of my wife, take care of my family. I learned more about God in that degree of development in my life. But the main thing I learned, The primary lesson I learned in that was is that God is my provider and not man. He supplies me and not people. And because of learning that, I have come to a place 
where I don't depend on people to take care of me. If I do it His way, do it the way He says to do it, if I just say the word, Lord, just say the word, if I am grateful, if I am a member of the body of Christ, I have learned that God will take care of me. I could have never learned that any other way. Oh, I can preach it. I can talk to you. I can show you in the scripture where it says it. But until it develops in you, it's just words. The word know in the Bible, that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That word know is, is make actual in your life. Make it real in your life. And so we come through this process. Now, Abraham had to sell out, get the out, leave everything. And he did. And what happened to Abraham? Did he multiply? Did God bless him with? Absolutely. Uh, the disciples had to leave all. But Jesus came, was preaching one day, and this rich young ruler, remember the story about him? This rich young ruler came. And it's right there where you're turned, right, right there in, 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 the, in the Bible. And this rich young ruler came. It's in that chapter. And he said, uh, he said Lord, what must I do to be saved? And, and Jesus said, well, you know what the Bible says. You know? And he says, oh, well, it says uh, to, to love the Lord thy God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. And love my neighbor as myself. He says, you said well. He says, but one thing you lack. One thing you lack in your development. What, yeah, you, you, you got this far. But one thing you lack in your development is that you need to sell everything. You need to sell out. Give it to the poor. Don't give it to me. Just give it to the poor. I'm not telling you this so it can enhance me. Give it to the poor. And then come follow me. What did the guy do? Did he, could he do it? He couldn't do it. The disciples were enamored with this. And they said, Lord, you know, who then can come into the kingdom? If, if rich people can't buy in, then who can get in? And it's there that Jesus says this. You know what? He says, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. Now, I know all the philosophies there. I, I still like it just straight out. It's... it's, it's, it's <laughs> I know that it's supposed to be a gate and, the, you know, all this stuff, you know, a, a gate called the eye of the needle. But I know all this stuff. But, but, what I'm, but I like it just like, I think it is more, it's more difficult for a rich man to go through an eye of a literal needle <laughs> than it is, wait a minute, let me, yeah, than a camel. Let me guess. It's, it's, it's more difficult for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Um, and Peter's... Wow, you know, the disciples are thinking, man, this is, this is too cool. And then here, here where you're at in your, in your scriptures, let's, let's read this. In Mark 10, 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed you. We've sold out. We've given it all and have followed you. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, our brethren, our sisters, our father, our mother, our wife, our children, our lands for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, in this life, for my sake and the gospels. <laughs> but he shall receive an hundredfold now. Isn't that great? And brothers... And sisters and mothers and children and lands. There's not one area of this person's life that goes void when they can give sacrificially. I have better relationships now than I've ever had. I have mothers in the Lord. I have, I have friends. Because I learned that through sacrificial giving, God will take care of me. And that doesn't happen often now. It doesn't happen often. The disciples could do it. Abraham could do it. The rich young ruler could not. Could you? Where are you in this development?
process that the Lord wants to take us through. Look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. Let me give you the fifth one. The fifth development in our spiritual development of giving. Vision. Vision. This believer, this person who has developed in this level of giving, looks at life differently. They look at the world differently. They see the world is in trouble, and no one can fix it. I don't care who you elect for president, they can't fix it. I don't care where you go, they can't fix it. And the world is in trouble, and the only redeeming force, the only thing that will ever change you or me, is Jesus Christ. We realize, when you come to this level, the person, the believer, realizes... That the vision of Jesus is to change lives one life at a time. This will seize you. Every penny you have, every minute you're alive, every breath you take, somehow is connected to the vision. This past week, uh, I had an opportunity to talk to Dr. Jason Kabler, a member here. And, uh, Jason and Angie live in, uh, in Nashville. And I had told Jason that I wanted to, to speak with him concerning this because I knew, I've known Jason for all these years. And, and, uh, and, and Jason experienced that transformation. Angie experienced that transformation right here at LifeGate. And, and, and I wanted to share, if it was okay with him, how he got to where he's at, which is a, which is a, a great place of, of success in, in, in his life, as young as he is. Uh, Jason, I was talking to him and he said this, he said, uh, he said, I can't say this to everybody, he says, but I can say it to you because you'll understand it. He said, I believe God wants me to be a billionaire philanthropist. Uh, what that means is a billionaire supporter. I said, yes, Jason. I believe that with you, brother. And he says, I really believe God wants me to be a very wealthy man. Now, you know, you, you can't say that to everybody. Uh, but Jason believes that. Uh, he sends his giving here. Uh, we get cards and letters all the time. And, and when they're here, they give the, and, 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 and he, he does well with this. And so I asked him if I could, if I could share how, how he does it. And I especially want you young people to listen to me. I want, I want you, you know, you, you, as young as you can be, all of us should listen, but I especially want you guys that are, that are about to go into, into college or high school. or, or that You need a plan. I want, I want to share this with you, Dr. Dr. Kabler's plan and what he said is necessary uh, to have a plan that will work for you. Number one, have a plan. Uh, start young with your plan. Start out making good decisions by leading a good life, a good moral life around good people. The, the good moral decisions will determine the direction that your life goes in. And he says that's one of the first things. You've, you've got to select your friends. You've got to be around good moral people. He says, get information and opinions from others. Learn what you can about the topic. From other people, not only books and school, but get it from people. He said he started going to, to, to dental uh, uh, practices when he was a little, little guy, thinking about it, talking to dentists. Uh, learn uh, from others' mistakes. Isn't that great? Yes. Isn't it better to learn from someone else's mistakes rather than make our own and learn from them? Yes. Learn from someone else's mistakes. I never went along with the crowd, Jason says. Usually the crowd is not right. I could, I could talk to you about Gideon. Have all the information possible and make certain that it is right for you. Now, that's the way he said it. The way I say it, make sure it is your passion. Make certain that it is something you really want to do. The second thing he says is work. <laughs> he said, you know, it's amazing to me. I went to school 
And I, and everybody, I, got, I graduated from, from, from college and, and I had my doctorate degree. And he says, everybody was calling me Dr. Cabler, but I had to go borrow money from my daddy so I could go to the movies with my friends. He says, it's amazing, even though I had all of this education and all of this ability, I never had any money until I worked. He said the worst day of his life was when he had to do that. <laughs> Number three, he says, use money instead of it using you. He says, when I went into my practice, he says, I, I went in major debt. That's, that's, that's a quote. I went in major debt to get my practice, but I got out of debt as soon as I could. And I used the money of other people. And he says, now, we put, we put back then what we could, but now we're putting back at least 20% of our income. And I have a fund for my retirement and I have a fund for my kids to go to college. And he says, I plan to retire when I'm 45 to 50. He has a plan right now to purchase several practices. But it begins with a plan. It begins with work. And young people, I want you to hear that. Now the reason I even mention that is because it's vision. Jason sees the vision of LifeGate. And the vision of LifeGate is summed up in that banner hanging on the wall. LifeGate Church, reaching people and making them devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Everything we do, every video, every cleaning the church, working in the yards, beautifying the building, everything we do is so that we can reach people. And bring them to a place of being devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And isn't that what it's all about? Isn't that where it has to come to? You see, I can come to the place one day when I leave this world, where I leave this life, and I go on, I can leave knowing that I did something important. I can leave fulfilled. I can leave knowing that I did it. You know, so right now, in this time in my life, I, I, I've, I've, I've developed to, to, this, to this potential that everything that I do, every, everything that I'm about, I'm so grateful for God for saving me. I'm a member of the body of Christ. I, 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 I do give sacrificially. I am a person that says, just say the word. I am obedient. But, but in my level of development right now and where I am with the Lord and where I know that the Lord wants us all to come is to that top level of vision. Because He is the only answer. You tell me one other thing, just one other thing that can take a, a soul sick man, a sin sick person dying. You tell me one other thing that can take that person and transform that person and make them a good person and a successful person. You tell me one other thing. You see, it all has to come down right here. Everything I do, everything I'm about, every breath I take is about the vision. Now, we've got to adapt that to our own lives. You all can't do what I do. This platform is not large enough to hold us all. But you've got to adapt that to your life and to where what you give is not because you're only grateful or what you give is not because you're just a member here or what you give is not because it's only you're being obedient or not because you just want to hear what he says or, or not because it's just a big sacrifice. But what it is is for the vision of reaching people. The vision of... Keep, listen, what, what it hinges on is heaven and hell. What, what it really hinges on is someone going to hell or going to heaven. If we're able to reach them, isn't that what it's all about? Amen. Isn't that the bottom line? In Matthew, Matthew chapter 4 verse 18. Look at this. Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I'll make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. What was the reason of leaving it and following? To become something. The ultimate 
point that we can come to in our evolvement is to be people that can reach people for Jesus, to become fishers of men. I'll make you fishers of men. I never ask you to give to our budget. Our budget's not very impressive. But I always ask you to give to our vision. The vision of reaching people. The vision of having a place that when people come here, they want to have what you have. Experience what you experience and know Jesus the way you know Jesus. Isn't that what it's got to be all about? And when we can come to that point, when we get to that place, we can be like that woman who came to Jesus and broke that alabaster box. Alabaster giving. Anointing him for his death. Alabaster giving. Taking anything because nothing is too good for Jesus. Nothing is too good for the vision. Nothing is too good for him. Nothing is good enough. Nothing, let me make sure I say it correctly. Nothing, nothing, there's not enough that we can do for Jesus. The best we've got is good. Is, help me. The most precious thing we have is what we need to anoint him with. We're all traveling through the, the journey with Jesus and through life, having an adventure. Now hear me right, God's going to bless anything you give in whatever level that you give from. God's going to bless that. But he desires that we all move into the area of understanding his vision. My prayer today is that each of us will come into that place, into the vision level of giving come to where we realize that what we're here to do is not just breathe in and breathe out. Not just to exist, find food and shelter. Not only to find a mate, be happy. Not only to develop in different levels. But we're really here to make a difference. What level of giving are you? And I want you to hear my heart and all of this on all of these lessons that we've done. I want you to hear my heart and, and what I've tried to project to us. God wants you financially liberated. Not in bondage, but in liberty. Not in liberty in your own financial situation, but in liberty so that we can do the vision and reach people. The greatest tool that Jesus has is his church. And he's using his church to reach people. And that's where we've got to come to the place of giving for. Is reaching people. Let's bow our heads. Father, we love you so much. You are a true and awesome God. We marvel at your goodness. We marvel at your love. We marvel at how you develop us and we ask you, Lord, today to bring us, develop us. Let us become the spiritual people. Let us become fishers of men. Let us sell it all. Give it all and everything that we give be towards that vision. Be with us, Lord, and help us. Show us. Teach us. Need healing in your body today? Jesus wants to heal you. The Bible says we can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Uh, you need someone to pray with you just so that you can develop and come into the place that Jesus wants, to, wants you to come into and, and develop in your giving. Just, it begins with a prayer. Lord, help me do this. Help me be all that I can be for you. Maybe your family situation is bad. Let's pray about that. Ask God to help us. Uh, maybe your job situation is not working well. God can help you. I believe God's already touched people this morning. But I believe there are still people that want 
to have hands laid on them and prayed for. And that's what the Bible encourages us to do. So that whatever you need, you need Jesus this morning. You need to rededicate your life. I want you to come down. I want to pray for you. Whatever that it is that you need, I want you to come. I want to bless you right now. In Jesus' name.